So I need to, as we start this, I need to spend a little time going over again some things that you heard this morning, perhaps in a little more detail, but just so that you have a good sense of, of what the history was that led up to the samurai age and then what ended it. As I mentioned, this is what the daimyo castles, the clan lords, daimyo means literally great lands, uh, the, the large uh, landowners. The daimyos were the clan leaders. They each had their own army of varying sizes, but those armies were the samurai. You will remember that in, 17, in 794, rather, the Japanese emperor had moved the capital from the city of Nara to the city of Kyoto, which was called Haiyan then. That's the start of the Haiyan period. And it was a time when the Japanese culture really developed. Uh, it, it exploded. It became unique into itself, not just sort of a reflection of what had been learned from China in the centuries before that. During this high-end period, it, it was such a time of art and literature and culture, <coughs> and all of that flourished. The, the uh, culture of Japan flourished, but at the same time, the power of the emperor and the court began to wither away. They got very occupied with uh, cultural matters at court, and were not paying as much attention to what was going on in the country. So that eventually, even though the emperor was technically still in charge as ruler of Japan from Kyoto, I'll use the modern name for it, um, the, throughout the rest of the country, they really were not paying attention to what was happening. They had delegated responsibility out to the daimyos and to the respective uh, samurai armies. So in a, a very direct way, the samurai military order grew as a response to the fact that the court in Kyoto was not really involving themselves as much in running the country anymore. And so the daimyos, as they grew in power, as they grew in land, and as I told you um, this morning, they could gain land and tax benefit from the land in a number of ways. If they, as the population of Japan grew and they needed more food, they could take over land that was uncultivated. And if they cultivated it, it would be theirs to control for a period of years. Later on, that became permanent and uh, they didn't have to pay taxes on that land. If they had land that had a monastery or a temple or a shrine on it, they didn't have to pay a rice tax on that, and so they could keep that, plus the fact that they were collecting up the taxes in the name of the emperor and the court in, in Kyoto, they then took a cut off the top, you know, like taxmen always have. And so they kept part of that, and they became more and more powerful at the same time that the emperor was allowing uh, their focus to be emperor and court, their focus to be on cultural matters rather than on running the country. These are the kinds of images we think of when we think of samurai, and these are fairly accurate. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of these aspects in terms of weapons and whatnot later on. Um, I've been asked before, well, what's with all the horns and the, you know, the scary faces and everything else? Well, scary is the whole point. These were men, uh, there were a few women, but almost entirely men who were involved in fighting face to face or from horseback and so part of um, their strategy was to look as fearsome as possible and so the armor was very practical in that it was able to protect them from uh, to a great extent from arrows and swords and those kinds of weapons which is what they were fighting against up until the 1500s when the portuguese introduced firearms into um, japan but the reason for the horns and if they wore masks, the masks, uh, sometimes half masks, sometimes full masks, they would be fearsome. They would look like demons because that, could, that was frightening. And if you frighten the foe that you're fighting with a sword, then you have an advantage. And so this is the re reason they look like that. The word samurai actually means to wait upon or one who accompanies. Uh, the very name implies that they had a lord or a master that they were responsible to and that their job was to protect that master, to fight for that master, to be the entourage for whoever that daimyo was. Um, a, there was a special name. Any samurai who lost their master, whose master was killed for any reason, was called a ronin. And one of the greatest legends in uh, all of Japan, it's based on a true story, but it's been retold many, many, many times, the, the tale of the 47 Ronin, who waits several years to get revenge over the person, uh, the other lord who was responsible for the death of their clan lord. So Ronin was a samurai without a master. It was a special category because the assumption was that a samurai should have a master, someone they serve. The samurai were a minor nobility um, and they were the warrior class in the medieval and early modern uh, Japan. 
As I mentioned, the Fujiwara clan, one of the clans, uh, the Fujiwara daimyo, ended up really controlling the throne for several hundred years by always providing the bride for the new, um, the, the new emperor. When uh, the emperor died and the new young emperor came uh, on board, they would provide a daughter to be a bride to the emperors, and so they were always part of the royal family, and they ended up controlling from behind the scenes. In the mid-12th century, uh, mid-1100s, two other powerful clans, the Taira and the Minimoto, challenged the Fujiwara and drove them from power. Then the Taira took over for about 20 years until finally the Minamoto came back and fought them, defeated them, and the, uh, that, that battle was called the Genpai, uh, Genpai-i War. These crossed swords are all the different places where they fought battles in that war. It was quite comprehensive around the island of, of uh, Honshu. The final battle was a sea battle, the Battle of Don Noura in 1185, in which the Minamoto finally defeated the Taira and the head of the Minamoto family became the ruler of Japan with the title Shogun. Uh, Minamoto no Yoritomo was the first of Shoguns. There were three different Shogun dynasties between the uh, end of the 1100s and the mid-late 1800s when the Meiji Restoration happened. The, these first shoguns began during the, uh, right at the end of the high end period and began the new period. Shogun literally means the commander of troops. It comes from the title Shai Ai Tai Shogun, which was the, the commanding general of expeditions against the barbarians, fighting against the Emishu and the Ainu peoples. In fact, one of our excursions is going to be go up uh, on Hokkaido and visit uh, an Ainu village. You can see their crafts and everything. They don't speak Japanese, they have their own language. Well, for a long time, the Japanese that were under the emperor were trying to subdue all those people and bring all people who were on the Japanese islands under the control of the authority of the emperor. Um, the, this man, Minamoto no Yoritomo, became the Azu ruler of Japan. The emperor became just a figurehead. And because of that, because the Minamotos and the other clan lords, their power came from the samurai. It came from their warrior armies. And one, the way that Minamoto actually won was in the battle against the Taira, the, 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 one of the most important battles where there were almost 200,000 warriors fighting. He looked like he was way outnumbered, but in the middle of the battle through negotiations, you know, he's a clever guy and very convincing, five major daimyo lords in the middle of the battle turned and joined his side. And so he ended up winning the Jinpai War because of that. Again, more images of what the, this is actually a photograph of a samurai, and the kind of image that you get. Um, one thing that I would uh, point out to this, and I'll talk about this later, you'll notice where the, the, uh, this samurai soldier's hand is on the, the, uh, the bow here. The, the bow that they used, the yumi as it's called, was asymmetrical. The handle where you held it was not in the middle. It's about two thirds of the way down. Well, the reason for that is they wanted a longbow because it would give them, and I, I'm saying this now because this is the only image I have that you can really see that. The uh, bow was long, like six plus feet long, because that gave more power, but you couldn't shoot a bow that long from horseback if your hand was in the middle of it. So they designed a bow, and that's still what they use today, where you held it down about a third of the way from the end so that the, the biggest part of the bow was, uh, was higher than that, um, just, just because that image is up there. The uh, military side of the samurai was called bushi. A bushi means warrior. And so the code that they lived by, the code of ethics and morality and training was called the bushi do. Do means the way of. And you'll get that in a lot of different uh, words. Uh, do at the end of a word means the way of whatever it is. So bushi do was the way of the warrior. Um, the, Daimyos, the landowners, were entirely dependent upon them. They were the ones that allowed them to remain in power, the ones that really controlled everything under them. And they did so for about 700 years, from the end of the 1100s to mid-late, um, well, to late 1800s. In the 15th and 16th century, you also had, and I had this question before, you also had another kind of warrior called a ninja. There really were ninjas. 
The samurai were the frontline warriors. You know, you faced them, you knew who they were. The ninjas were assassins and spies. They were, you know, they didn't all wear black with masks unless they were fighting, sneaking up on somebody at night. They ordinarily would just blend into the crowds. They were this sort of special agents and the assassins that would do the secret work. And so the idea was they were able to blend in. But the samurai were always right up front. You knew who they were. Um, it's estimated that only 10% of the population of uh, Japanese males were samurai. It's not like every, every Japanese man was a samurai warrior. It was a very distinct military class. And of the 10% of the male population that were samurai, about 1.3 million were high samurai, which meant a high samurai got to ride on a horse. The rest of them, about 500,000, were low samurai, which means they, they fought on foot, which is why you often have uh, pictures of, so of long spears, because the only way for a person on foot to fight against someone who is on horseback is if you have a longer weapon. And so that's why that was commonly used. One thing about the samurai that was very different as well was that they were very uh, well educated. The samurai were expected not only to be uh, warriors, but also to be very literate, very cultured. Um, they believed in a harmony between war and learning. In fact, there was an expression, bunbu ryodu. Bunbu ryodu means a uh, pen and sword in one accord. They were expected to be poets. They were expected to be musicians. They were expected to be practitioners of the tea ceremony and to meditate, um, to to practice calligraphy. Uh, they were expected to be very cultured. In fact, this was so much the case that during the Edo period, uh, when the capital was in Edo or Tokyo, then in the 16 to 1800s, uh, there was a higher literacy rate in Japan than there was in Western Europe because of the, uh, the very strong emphasis that the samurai should be literate and cultured. And because of that, they then caused the rest of the culture to follow that kind of direction. As I mentioned, some of the large battles uh, that we had, and you can see here, they are using spears, they are using bows, you can see the arrows here, and they are using swords. Uh, some of the weapons I'll talk about. This uh, battle involved, the Battle of uh, Kawajinakajima involved uh, about 160,000 warriors on both sides. There are, there's another battle, they're estimated there were 200,000 warriors. Now, not all the battles were that big, but they, that's how many warriors they had to call upon uh, when the various of the daimyo clans would come in conflict, conflict with one another, and frequently they would team up so that you had these large groups of warriors fighting on both sides. One of the things that had happened, I mentioned earlier that there were uh, codes that were set in place one of the, the Taiho Code set a very clear hierarchy in society, with the emperor at the top followed by the court nobility. Well, when the, the shoguns under Minamoto, the first shogun, in the late 1100s, when he took over control of the country, the hierarchy technically didn't seem to change a lot, but the authority that they had did. So what you ended up with was there was an emperor at the top followed by the court nobility. These were the high-ranking officials who were former formal nobles. But un technically underneath that, but actually running the whole country, was the shogun, the military commander, the one who was both in charge of the military and also running the government. Underneath the shogun were the daimyos, who are the clan lords, and each of them had an army of samurai, and they were the minor nobility. Under the, and there were classes of samurai as well. There were six different grades of samurai. Underneath the samurai, you had peasants, most of whom were farmers, and then craftsmen, and then merchants. In uh, traditional, medieval, and early modern Japan, merchants were the lowest class because the Japanese had very little regard for someone who didn't make something or grow something, uh, but rather just traded in things. You know, just made money off of other people's work, basically. It wasn't until much later, after the Meiji Restoration, when they were trying to modernize the country and really develop them in manufacturing, the merchants became very powerful. But during most of the time period of the history of Japan, the merchants were at the very bottom of the social order. Speaking of the weapons, 
the most standard weapon and the one they're most known for in terms of the samurai were, was the long sword or katana. Uh, katana weapons, the Japanese were perhaps the finest metallurgists in the world. The Japanese swords that they made were, were the best of them were great works of art. If you go in museums in Japan today, you will see just the blades usually, not, not with the handle or the wrapping, it's just the metal blade. They'll be on display as a work of art because of the astonishing ability that they had. The, the challenge here and the thing that the Japanese mastered was the edge of a sword has to be uh, hard enough and therefore more brittle, has to be hard enough to hold a very, very sharp edge and they quite literally are as sharp as razors. But if the whole sword is made of that kind of metal, then the whole sword is brittle, and if it's hit, if it strikes something, it's liable to shatter. And so they would be able to uh, take a softer version of steel and blend the two together so that you had just an edge that would hold uh, the, a sharp edge, and then the rest of the sword was strong enough to be able to take a blow. They were the best in the world at this, um, and so their swords really are considered works of art. But they also, there were two other kinds of blades of shorter lengths. The um, wakazashi was a second length of sword that you see here below the katana. And then this sort of long knife, you could call it a long knife or a short sword, was the tanto. The samurai carried what was called the daisho. Daisho, remember I said earlier, dai means great or um, primary or grand or super. The daisho literally means long and short, or great and small, because they would carry two swords. The katana always, and then depending upon what they were expecting, they might carry the wakazashi, or they might carry the tanto. As one guide said to us, um, for those who carried the, the katana and the tanto, that it was, the, the long sword was to kill the enemy, the sword short was the sword, short sword, <laughs> sword, <laughs> The short sword was to kill yourself. That if you were dishonored in some way and it was necessary to take your own life, then that's what the short blade was primarily used for. Um, in addition to the daisho, the two swords that they carried, as I say, they also used the yumi, which are the, um, the tall bows, the asymmetrical bows. These are two of them standing up here. They also used various kinds of spears or pole weapons. Especially, I mean, the, the mounted soldier, the mounted samurai would use those, but they were especially valuable to the foot soldiers of the samurai. Um, they would use um, various kinds. They had cannon that they would use on their ships and in castles, but the samurai never really developed mobile cannon for use in field uh, warfare. That came later when the Westerners came in. Various kinds of staff weapons, clubs, truncheons, all sorts of things, and also the yoroi. This is an example, and this is the kind of demon face I was talking about. Yoroi were the lamellar leather. They would take either pe or, or armor. They would take either pieces of leather that were stiffened and lacquer them, and then sew them together. Or sometimes they would take pieces of metal, lacquer them, and sew them together, so that they ended up being a flexible shield against an arrow strike or a bow or sometimes even spear. Later on, some of these samurai actually used some plate armor like they use in Western Europe. Um, the a full armor, yaroi armor, for a samurai could weigh between 60 and 70 pounds. So this was a lot of weight to carry into battle when you were fighting somebody with a sword or you know, literally, literally physical combat, hand-to-hand -hand kind of things. But this is what they wore. Um, and they continued to wear this kind of um, armor and use these kinds of weapons up until the late 1870s when the the Meiji Emperor really got rid of the samurai, which we'll talk about. I said a little bit this morning, and I'll talk more tomorrow evening, about religion. They really did take um, the Shinto faith, was very important to all Japanese, as it is today, and also Buddhism, particularly for the, for the samurai, Zen Buddhism. They combined those in, I'll talk tomorrow about the combination of Shinto and <coughs> Buddhism, which is called um, Shinbutsu Shugo, where most Japanese today practice both religions. It's not either or, it's both and. It's estimated that 80% of Japanese have a, a Shinto shrine called the Kamidana in their home, but 60% of all the people will have a Buddhist shrine in their home, which means you've got a huge overlap there. 
and Zen Buddhism especially, the meditation of Zen Buddhism, assisted the samurai with dealing with the fear of, of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone and fighting them with a sword, and it also helped them deal with the difficulty of you know, having to kill other people, sometimes in significant quantities for the great warriors. Um, and so that was very important to them as they went along. This, on the left-hand side here, this is an image from the sort of Western European uh, mythology. This is a Western knight killing a dragon. On the right-hand side, you have a samurai uh, warrior with a spear killing a dragon. Now, I use these two images because there is a legitimate parallel that can be drawn between the concept of chivalry as it existed in Western Europe um, and the, the Bushido, or the way of the warrior, the ethical system and the sort of code of conduct that the samurai use. Now, there's not an absolute parallel here. It's not the same thing, but it's a way for us to understand it. Chivalry really began in the 800s in Western Europe under Charlemagne. The problem was, it's always true when you have <coughs> soldiers, warriors, they're trained in the way of combat. If they don't have somebody to fight, what do they do? They find somebody to fight, or they fight each other. Why do you think sailors have so many bar fights, you know, when they're in port? It's because you train an army, a military, to do battle, and then if they don't have anybody to fight against, they're hard to control. And so, in Western Europe, first Charlemagne, in conjunction, because he was the head of the Holy Roman Empire, in 800 he was named the Holy Roman Emperor, in conjunction with the church, developed a code of conduct for Western knights to try to keep them from killing peasants and killing each other and you know doing other terrible things. And so that involved uh, first a warrior ethos, that they saw themselves as being in a particular kind of um, military role or martial role. But also there was a knightly piety, an expectation that holiness was going to be part of their, of their lifestyle, of their ethos. This is why you have all the stories of the Knights of the Round Table seeking the Holy Grail, the cup that Christ drank from, and various other strong religious connotations to Western Knights. You, they were expected to have courtly manners, they were expected to show honor and nobility to protect those who were weaker. This was all built into the idea of chivalry, which is based upon the, you know, the word for horse, um, the, because these are mounted knights. And so this was an effort to try to get them focused in the right direction and to use their strength and their skills in a way that was positive. Well, compared to that, the uh, Bushido likewise started around the same time, about the 8th century. It was greatly developed in the 13th to the 16th centuries. And it uh, basically the, the aspects of Bushido were that a, a samurai should have reckless courage. Later on, this got interpreted in terms of suicidal uh, bonsai charges in the Second World War. And I'll talk in a few minutes about how they tried to kind of expropriate the Bushido code of the samurai into the Second World War, the Japanese military did, when in fact it had ended in the 1800s, technically. So this reckless courage and extreme devotion to family and even more so to your lord, to your daimyo, the one above you. Confucianism, which had come over from China to Korea and then to Japan, has a very strong emphasis, as we'll talk about tomorrow, on recognizing your place in society and doing your job as responsibly as you can, as you can and especially of having loyalty to those who are above you in society. And the, the Confucius influence absolutely made the samurai uh, believe that their loyalty to their Lord was higher than anything else. To disappoint your Lord, to fail your Lord in some way, um, would prompt one to commit seppuku, to try to regain your honor. And uh, I'll mention that again in a minute. The samurai also cultivated intellect, as I said, and culture, calligraphy, the tea ceremony, uh, poetry. They were very committed to developing in the martial arts, not only the way of the sword, but also hand-to-hand um, -hand combat and all other manners of martial arts. Again, I asked the question before how many people had seen The Last Samurai. There are a number of scenes in there where using wooden swords, they are practicing. You know, they're fighting against one another. They're practicing all the time because they were expected to maintain their skill in, martial, in the fields of martial arts. The samurai were supposed to be indifferent to suffering and discomfort, as well as indifferent to material wealth. The samurai were never paid in money of any kind. They were given food, 
they, their, their needs were cared for. They often were given homes. Um, on the south end of Kyushu, there's an area called Shiran, which have a number of samurai homes that still exist. They are lovely but modest homes. So they were cared for, provided for, given homes, given food, and they had a right to expect service from the peasants and other people below them in the social order. But they were never given money, and they were not supposed to value that. They were committed to honor, to honesty, to compassion, generosity, self-discipline. It was considered dishonorable to be taken by an enemy or to surrender to an enemy or to lose a battle that you were called to fight on behalf of your lord. And the result of that could often lead a samurai soldier to commit seppuku, uh, what we used to call harikiri, which literally means belly cutting. It was to take the short tanto and the idea here was that if you were dishonored by being defeated or being captured, the only way to regain your honor was to prove your mettle, to prove that you were uh, strong, that you were willing to, um, you know, you still had the will to do what was needed. Well, the idea of taking a, a short a tanto, a short blade, and inserting it in your abdomen and drawing it across, not only was horrifically painful, but sometimes it could take hours and hours to die. The very willingness to do that regained one's honor because it showed that you were strong and that you were committed and that you were loyal. And so by doing that, you could regain your honor. Often you would have someone who was a, a follower, a, a fellow soldier, someone else, that once you actually committed the act of, of stabbing yourself and drawing the sword to cut off your head, otherwise, you could survive for hours and hours and hours and bleed to death. Um, and so it was a very painful way. And so as an act of kindness, they sometimes would do that if someone committed seppuku. Um, the idea, this, this honor, uh, there's a lot of uh, samurai, because they were very literate, who've written about it. And they would say things like one samurai writer said, it is shameful for a man to die without having first risked his life in battle. This was very much the military kind of orientation that they had. This image here on the left-hand side, um, this is General Akashi Kedayu, who had lost a battle in the name of his, of his master, and he has just written his, he's a real person, he, this really happened, but this is an artistic representation. He has just written his death poem, which was for someone who committed seppuku, ordinarily they would write a death poem. In the, in the Last Samurai, you will remember the scene where the, um, the samurai leader, um, Katsumoto, uh, Katsumoto, is uh, under house arrest, or he's arrested, and the American sticks his head in and says, how is your poem going? And he said, I'm having trouble finding an ending. <laughs> well, the, the whole point there is that before committing seppuku, which they were encouraging him to do, one must complete the poem, uh, and that's the death poem. So in this case, this general is preparing to, uh, to commit suicide, seppuku, after having written his death poem. And again, they could regain honor that way. In the Shinto faith, if one died a common death, or even worse, a dishonored death, then you were committed to the land of Shomi, or I'm sorry, Yomi. Show me something different, Yomi. Yomi was the place of darkness, the place of shadows. It actually is very similar to the Greek idea of Hades where you are separated from the living, but it's an area of darkness and lack of clarity and very unpleasant. Well, if one committed seppuku as an act of regaining honor, then you, uh, particularly if you did it as a way to try to assist your lord or your nation, this was some of the motivation of the kamikaze pilots, by the way, then you could, rather than being committed to Yomi, the place of uh, darkness, you could be reborn as a great spirit or a guardian spirit, a kami it's called, to be a guardian kami would be a great honor, you know, to live forever as a spirit that was responsible for helping protect your master and others. If you've visited any of the shrines, sometimes the Buddhist temples, as you walk into them, sometimes they've got these sort of cages on either side that have these statues of these very fearsome looking beings. Those are guardian kami. And the idea was that if you regain your honor before you die, then you may come back as a guardian and have still have a worthwhile uh, eternity. Because of the willingness of the Japanese to, to die in battle or to take their own life, um, St. Francis Xavier, when he came to, to Japan and brought Catholicism, he once wrote, there is no nation in the world that fears death less than Japan. The Japanese people were willing to die. Um, 
you did have, if your Lord was alive, you did have to have the permission of your Lord to do so. Um, if they told you, you know, no, you can't do that yet, then you were not allowed to. But, um, and there's a scene where the sister of uh, Katsumoto asks him, please give me, please allow me to take my own life. And he said, no, you know, you need to do what you're told. Yes? I'm sorry, the what? Right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know exactly. Um, the various wild animals, tigers and dragons, um, are very, very important in the, in the whole mythology. In fact, uh, carp, for instance, the fish, which are the, you know, the nishiki koi, the, the colored carp we see. But a carp was a very powerful animal of the Japanese. Uh, the Hiroshima baseball team are called the carp because the, uh, they had this, the legend was that a carp who was strong enough to swim all the way upstream would turn into a dragon. So this probably is a version of a tiger or something like that. Um, they, have, they have lions um, a lot. You'll see lions guarding the entrance to temples, etc. But they didn't have any lions in this part of the world, so they didn't really know what they looked like. But they had this legend of a lion. So anyway, I don't know exactly what that is. The samurai eventually, after the Meiji Restoration in 1866 to 68, in 19 or in 1873, just five years after it was restro restored, the Meiji Emperor abolished the feudal system, which means he abolished the whole principle of the samurai. He wanted to have a conscription army where everyone had the same standardized training and the same standardized weaponry to become a modern Western-style army, and the samurai didn't fit into that, and so. It was declared the samurai, and this is in the movie, the last, uh, the, the last samurai, is this period of time when this is happening. They were not allowed to wear the top knot, which was the sign of the samurai, the hair uh, knot. They were not allowed to carry the two swords, the daisho, anymore. Um, they were not allowed to kill commoners who they thought offended them or didn't show their proper respect, which had always been a right of the samurai. You know, they could take the life of someone below them in the social structure if they felt like they were not being respected. None of that was available to them anymore. In fact, they were no longer to be called samurai. They were called shizoku. Shizoku means warrior families. It was sort of a recognition of their history, but they had no authority beyond that. And uh, the uh, imperial court gave all of the samurai a, if you will, a retirement fund. Most of them were then bought back for a, a lump sum because that was economically more feasible for the government. And remember, the samurai had never dealt in money. They didn't know anything about money. And so many of them took the lump sum payment, immediately spent it, and then had no way to support themselves. They actually had to change the laws in Japan to allow these former samurai, now called uh, shizoku, to uh, become weavers or farmers or to take on various other things. Some of them went into the military and were successful at that. Some of them went into some of the corporations that began to develop under the, uh, the new Meiji approach to manufacturing and whatnot but it was a very, very difficult time. In fact, even though it was the samurai, particularly the Satsuma and Chosen family clans, the, their samurai were the ones that had put the emperor back in power. Once he tried to get rid of all of this uh, tradition, it was a very traumatic time, um, the Satsuma and others rose up in rebellion. It's called the Satsuma Rebellion, realizing that what they had done was destroy their own way of life. And so uh, they were not successful, that, that rebellion was put down. And that's what that movie, The Last Samurai, is all about. Those who rebelled against all the changes that were taking place. Um, and here you have two elderly samurai gentlemen who have very little to do late in life. Um, they had These two examples had been real samurai, and yet they were no longer warriors. They no longer are recognized as being nobility in, in Japan by this time in their life. One of the things that we see in modern times, uh, there was a very strong effort. So the, the code of Bushido, actually the word Bushido was not really used until late in the 1800s. It existed, but it wasn't commonly used. It sort of got used in descriptions of what the samurai had been after the fact, but then later on everyone uses that as the way of the warrior. They did definitely have the kind of ethical uh, code, uh, code of conduct, code of honor that I'm talking about, but it, not, it often was not called Bushido back then. But as the growth in the militarism of the 20th century, uh, late 18th and uh, late 1800s and early 1900s, as the Japanese uh, military took over the government of Japan, 
as they, in trying to reestablish themselves as a modern, uh, technologically advanced manufacturing country, uh, and the need they had to try to go out and find the resources to do that, since they don't exist for the most part on the islands of Japan, um, they began, the, the military in Japan began to try to reclaim this idea of the Kodo Bushido and to have this sort of martial spirit and it got reflected in the military of the Japanese army and navy in the Second World War. They really engendered some of the characteristics of the old Bushido like dedication to the emperor, the fact that defeat is shameful, that to die um, you know, a fearless death was the greatest of honors, um, that to have um, to Surrender is always dishonorable. There's never a reason to surrender that there, you should have no compassion for defeated enemies. Now, some of this stuff was not part of the original Code of Bushido, but that developed in sort of the modern idea in the early 20th century. So the idea of the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Imperial Japanese Army was that there was no reason to have compassion on a defeated enemy, even if it was women and children that they did not deserve any compassion. And this is the reason you get the Bataan Death March and some of the other kinds of uh, quite terrible things that happened in the Second World War. And that those who surrender are worthy only of contempt. Some of this thinking is not only what led to some of the almost suicidal bonsai, char bonsai charges, but also the kamikaze pilots. When it was very clear, that, and we'll talk about them a little bit later in one of the lectures, when it was clear that the Japanese had no chance of winning the Second World War, for the kamikaze pilots, they didn't have, uh, the, the planes they had left were not the best planes. The pilots they had left were frequently not well trained and the idea of them being able to engage in combat with other airplanes was they simply didn't have the training for it. And so the idea of crashing, of taking their own life and doing so as an act of commitment in support of your uh, nation, of your emperor, was seen as an act of honor based upon the old the, the reinterpretation of the old Code of Bushido. Um, in fact, some scholars have said that if, if the Japanese military in the Second World War had not been so emphatically trying to pursue the Code of Bushido, which led to suicide charges and things, they probably would have done better in some battles because they ended up unnecessarily uh, losing uh, many of their warriors and pilots because of uh, those approaches. It's even been said that modern Japanese business you're all aware of the fact that the Japanese worker, it's, it's common for them to work 60, 70 hours a week. And they, long, long days and weekends, and the whole commitment to those who are above you, your, your <laughs> employer, the business you work for, your bosses have been sort of inserted themselves into this idea that they are your Lord. And so you have a commitment to do whatever is necessary in order to fulfill the desires of your Lord. And so this is kind of the mentality that they've engendered to try to get their salarymen, as they call them, to work hard. And the promise is that you'll you'll always have a job if you do that. And so in the same way that if you served your Lord, you will always be part of the clan in the old days. So there's been an effort to try to capture that kind of, um, if you will, uh, military discipline in modern times as well. Sometimes to benefit, sometimes to not. I'm gonna always keep putting that up there in case you wanna make a note of it where the lectures are. Are there any questions about Samurai Kota Bushido this time in history? And there they sat stunned for some moments. Yes? I'm curious, um, where did the Japanese get their horses from? Where did the Japanese get their horses from? Well, they, um, the, the source of all horses in East Asia was Mongolia originally. Uh, Mongolia or further to the west. I'm going to do a talk later on about Silk Road empires is one of the talks I'll do later on in the cruise. And China, for instance, um, the, the horses in China, because of lack of potassium and other minerals in the grass, their horses were not strong enough to carry a rider. The best they could do is like three horses to pull a chariot. But the horses of the Mongolians, which were smaller horses, but were very strong because of the grass that they fed on up in the north, um, the, and they were a nomadic herdsman people, um, they were desperately desired by the Chinese, then later by the Koreans, and by the Japanese. Um, in fact, there were whole wars fought over trying to get horses. There were, there were horses in the Fergana region, which is further to the west of, um, of current-day China, over in the northern stands, if you will. Uh, and the horses there, in an area called Fergana, Fergana Valley, the horses there were so big and so powerful, the Chinese 
decided that they must have been uh, a cross between a horse and a dragon because they were so much bigger and stronger and these they called them the heavenly horses who sweated blood um, you know and, and they sent two two armies to try to capture these horses never were successful so they had to trade for them same thing horses came from uh, Mongolia and from further in the west in the Silk Road era into China from there into um, to Korea and into Japan there's also you know the connection up north from the island of Hokkaido where we're going to be tomorrow uh, the, the narrow straits that lead over into uh, Russia so there would have been a, a more direct access to bring some of those horses in that way as well so any other questions yes Right. Yeah, the idea, I mean, the, the Book of Five Rings, uh, there are the Art of War, Sun Tzu, which is Chinese, but it reflects some of the same kinds of ideas, um, is, is that these kinds of martial disciplines can be applied to all aspects of life. And that and the you know, sort of commitment to one who is above you in society, which is a very Confucian idea, um, were, have been used to try to engender a kind of work ethic which most of us in the West would completely rebel against. You know, I mean, we, we work too hard as it is, but um, anyway. Any other questions? Yes? So where did organized crime fit into the social plan structure? Where did organized crime fit into the uh, social structure? So we're talking about the Yakuza, uh, the Japanese crime. There have always been uh, outliers in every culture. Uh, every culture has had crime, every culture has had organized crime of some kind. I don't really, I'd have to research the, and that'd be fascinating, I haven't really thought about it, how all of that developed, because the Yakuza have a very samurai-like discipline. In fact, your commitment to your lord is such that if you in, in, if you're Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia, to use a term most people would understand, that's a bad uh, parallel, but it's organized crime in Japan. If you disappoint your master or need to show dedication, you cut off a, a, one of the the knuckles of your hand, of your fingers, and so you know you'll you'll see images of yakuza, and they'll have you know a third of their little finger or two thirds of the little finger or whatever gone, because this was their way of showing their commitment to the person above them, which is very much a samurai kind of idea, even though they they didn't do that. It makes it harder to use a sword if you don't have all your fingers, uh, but. <laughs> So the, but the, um, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Somewhere along the way, there would have been, and perhaps it, it could have been a development out of the idea of the Ronin, that they didn't have masters anymore. Uh, they no longer had daimyos that they served, and so they still, you know, they would wander, and there are stories of wandering Ronin who would basically sell their services as mercenary kind of warriors uh, to anyone who needed them. It may have been that that developed into organized crime, but I'm just surmising. I don't know that to be a fact. So that's an interesting question. Yes? Right. Well, Japan had always had, because they are, of course, islands, they've always had a naval capability of some kind. Um, whenever they tried to invade Korea, Korea, it turned out, in the Imjin Wars of the late 1500s, they defeated the Navy, even though the Japanese Army was winning, the Japanese Navy was defeated by, uh, by Korea and had to withdraw. They had always had um, naval forces. That's one of the major ways, because they are islands, that's how you got your troops from one place to another. It's much more efficient, especially because Japan are all mountainous islands. You know, it's not, particularly before modern times when they developed tunnels and roads, um, it, the, to, the best way, easiest way to get your troops from one place to another is by ship. And so they had always developed naval capabilities, and they did have naval battles. They were not nearly as large in Japan as the uh, land battles, which, as I say, sometimes could be 150, 160, 200,000 samurai fighting. But, um, but they did have sea battles as well. Um, primarily, they were land armies, but they did have navies as well. Anything else? Yes? About how many daimyos did they have? 
the um, it, it varied. They used to have um, the typical during most of this time was there was something over 200. There had been many more than that at one time, and then families intermarried. They consolidated, um, and the more you know, the, if, as clans back in even pre samurai times, but as clans would unify, they would have that much more territory, that many more people, that much uh, more potential power. And so if you look at the crests, every, um, every daimyo, every clan had a crest. Usually it's some form of threes. You know, it'll be three circles or three, you know, um, three kind of comma looking things that are interwoven or whatever. Those crests represent the whole clans and there were, uh, I think 220, if I remember correctly, somewhere in that neighborhood of those kinds of clan crests that represented major clan families. Thank you all very much.